Okay, I'm going to get started now. Um, if you do me a favor and just turn off your cell phones, put them on silent or vibrate. Um, I've been here many, many times, uh, but I, I don't recognize a lot of these faces, which is good. So it's always good to see new people. Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction before I start. Uh, my name is Lawrence, and I'm a real estate lawyer. And my offices are located in the Young and Shepherd Young and Finch area, right across from Alaska Square. We do predominantly residential real estate, some commercial estates, wills, cars, attorney, but the focus of our practice is residential real estate. Okay. Um, I've been practicing for a number of years. I'm not going to bore you with my whole background except to say that we do lots of real estate and we know what we're doing. Um, most of our business comes from referrals, from agents just like you. Our uh, firm's been around a long time. We also get a lot of repeat business. I operate on a real simple principle, give good service, fair prices, close deals, and people will come back and it works. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about myself. Uh, one of the other things I do is I, I lecture frequently. And um, I don't know, a few people probably have seen me before, been here many, many times. And most of the topics I cover are things that uh, are relevant to what you as real estate agents do every day. The other thing I do just before I start is I have a monthly newsletter, um, which I post on my website. And if you want to get a copy of it, it's free. Just give me your business card at the end. You can grab one of my pens and cards. Give me your business card. I'll add you to my monthly newsletter. I talk about topics like I'm going to talk about today. Okay. So what I want to talk about today is uh, a new topic that I thought of is mistakes that agents make when they prepare agreements of purchase and sale. Um, most of the time, sorry, yes. yes. Nice to see you. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. Good to see you. You guys are in good hands, eh? Number one. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Nice to see you. Okay. Thanks for coming in. Um, most of the time when I get an agreement of purchase and sale, it is on a resale deal, it's done. I mean, it's finalized except for conditions on inspection financing status. So I don't usually see them before they're signed. And sometimes they, there are inconsistencies or mistakes in those agreements, which can create problems for you and for me when it comes time for closing. So I'm going to talk about some of the most common mistakes I see agents make. Okay. The first one is um, when you're the listing agent and you're selling, it's not uncommon for an agreement to contain what are called representations and warranties. And the most common of those that you'll all know about are seller warrants and represents that all the channels and fixtures will be in good working order on closing. Okay. There are other kinds of representations and warranties that kind of get thrown into an agreement without much thought. And sometimes without reviewing them with your seller can create problems. So for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I had a deal where um, client was selling. In the agreement, the seller represented that all the chattels and fixtures were in good working order, except they forgot to mention that the dishwasher was not working. Okay? So the buyer goes to do a visit maybe three or four days before closing and says the dishwasher is not working. There's a clause in the agreement that says the seller warrants and represents everything will be in working order. That created a problem. Okay. Um, the problem was that the buyer thought they were getting everything in working order. They go to look at the property. It's not working order. That problem could have been avoided simply by not just cavalierly <coughs> throwing that clause in the agreement without reviewing it with the seller saying you are giving a representation or a promise that everything's working. Is everything working? If this, if the agent, would have asked that question, the seller would have said the dishwasher's not working, and they could have amended the clause to say, save it except for the dishwasher, which is not working, and the buyer agrees to assume as is. So my point is, when you are putting together agreements, you can't just throw these clauses in there without giving it some thought and actually reviewing it with your seller. So when you're signing an agreement, and I know you do these all over the place and at all hours of the night, you have to actually look at the contract and review it with your client. Of course, you're going to review important points like the purchase price, the deposit, the closing date, but all the other schedules that every agent says, oh, we just use those automatically. You can't just throw them in there without actually reviewing it with your seller and saying, is this accurate? Because you're giving a representation or warranty, which if it turns out to be untrue, it could scuttle the deal or result in a lawsuit after closing. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, another one that I see common mistake is the survey clause. 
when you are selling the property, um, what I sometimes see is a clause that says the seller agrees to provide the buyer with an existing survey of the property showing the current location of all dwellings and structures built on the property. That's a problem. The problem I had was, just to give you an example, and all of my lectures are basically centered around things that I go through in my practice, things that I see. I had a deal about a month ago where that clause was in the agreement. The listing agent gave them a survey. The survey of the property was fine, except that it didn't show the addition that was built on the property. The buyer's lawyer gets the survey, shows it to his client, and says, is the survey accurate? And the buyer says, doesn't show the addition. The buyer's lawyer then looks at the agreement and says, well, the agreement obligates the seller to give a survey that shows the structure of all everything built on the property. This survey doesn't show it. Therefore, they write to me and say, we want a new survey, which they were entitled to. I have to then call the seller and explain, you're going to have to buy them a survey. The seller is going to say, why do I have to do that? And I'm going to have to tell them because that's what the contract says. Well, why does the contract say that? I don't know. That's because your agent probably didn't look at the survey or ask you whether the survey was accurate and instead just threw that clause in there. So my, my point there with surveys is when you're selling, number one, you don't need to give them a survey. There's no legal obligation to provide a survey. You can say the, send, the, the vendor agrees to provide existing survey if available. That will get you out of all kinds of trouble. Existing survey if available. That way, if the buyer says we want a survey, the seller can say we don't have one. You're not getting one solves the problem. They can't then say, well, we want a survey. If you want one, go buy one. We don't have one. When you put that clause in there, the one that I said before, without giving it any thought, without reviewing it with the seller to say, is this survey accurate? Then you're going to have a problem like this client had. And guess who ends up paying for the survey in that situation? The agent. Right. The agent's going to have to fork over 1200 1500 bucks, whatever it could be less, I don't know. Or give them a credit on the statement of adjustments. And worse than it, worse than you having to pay for it, you don't look good in front of your client. Okay? And that's not what you want if you want to build your business. Okay? So you have to be careful with that. Another thing that I see um, frequently is uh, condos. Yeah. What about the survey? Uh, I never I go and measure the depth of a, a burger. Measure it? Measure it. Yeah. You don't have but, to. I know. Um, uh, but for the survey, for example, it shows 100 feet depth. Yeah. But actually, maybe it is 90 feet okay. or 110. Yeah. You don't know. You don't know. Okay. For example, like now, I had an offer that. Asian lady put a very, very heavy condition for survey. Yeah. Just I remove it and I said existing survey is attached. Right. But I think it's better we don't give any survey. Am I right or no? Depends on the situation. You can say existing survey as attached. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what you're getting. It's right there. <coughs> right? You can do that. That's fine. But my point is don't give them something that you can't provide. Don't promise to give them something that you don't have because they can make an issue out of it like they did in this case. But maybe existing survey, maybe the survey is attached to Agri Man. Yeah, that's fine. The measurement is different. If the measurement's different, the agreement itself says, if you look at the top where it says depth frontage, it'll you put in numbers. It also says right after more or less. So that gives you a little bit of wiggle room. What does more or less mean? More or less means case law of 5%. So if you're off by 5%, you're okay. Now, if you say that the seller agrees to provide a survey and you attach the survey and you put the frontage is 50 feet and it turns out that the frontage is 30 feet, you're going to have a problem because a lawyer like me would look at that survey and say, you promised us 50 feet, you're only giving us 30 feet. We want a reduction in the price. What about the title insurance? 
the title insurance is coming in if no survey available. Right. right. Okay. So that's a good question. I first of all, I know more about title insurance than any lawyer because I worked there for 14 years before I went back to practice. So what title insurance does is it says to buyers, if you don't have a survey, you can close without one. It will satisfy your lender's requirement for a survey. And in the event you close without a survey, and there's a problem after that would have been revealed had you bought a new survey, title insurance will cover you for that. But if you have the survey and you don't notice the survey is different, in terms of measurements okay so that's a different story if you have a survey and after closing you say i thought i was getting 50 feet and i'm only getting 45 it's not necessarily clear that a title insurance company will compensate you for the difference they probably won't i but swimming how about what swimming pool. what about it if a swimming pool is there but doesn't not showing on without, the survey yeah without okay. get permits they build the swimming Okay, so in order for you to, with title insurance, you're asking yes. me? Okay, in order to make a claim under a title insurance policy, you have to have a loss. So what's the loss? Just the existence of the swimming pool or the fact that it doesn't have a permit? What's, what's, the, what's the loss? The fact that the, are you telling me the buyer moves in, he... For example, the swimming pool is leaking or... Is, no, 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 they don't cover that, no. They don't cover leaks. They don't cover your furnace not working. They don't cover leaking basements. That, that's not title insurance. Okay. Okay. So back to status certificates. Obviously, I would encourage every agent to make every purchase conditional on lawyers' review of status certificate. That's a starting point. Okay. Now, I was just talking to Greg before, and I know from experience that the condo market is still very hot. And there's still multiple offers on condos. Um, and sometimes I will, just going off topic a bit, sometimes an agent will call me and say, Lauren, I want to refer you a client. Here's the situation. We, we, we identified a condo that we're going to put an offer on. We know there's going to be multiple offers. We want to go in with no conditions. That's fine. That's your decision. However, before we do that, we want you to look at the status certificate to make sure everything's okay. Okay, no problem. I will, and can you look at it before we make the offer? And I will say yes, I will do that on a few conditions. Number one, you have to send me the status certificate. Now, does everyone know what the status certificate is? It's not five pages. The status certificate includes all the documents from the condo court. Okay? Now, most cases we're getting them electronically, which is great because I will get an email from you saying, here's the status, and I will review the status certificate, the bylaws, the regulations, the rules, the declaration, the financial statements, the reserve fund, uh, everything. And then I will look at it, and I will say to you, you send me that, you send me the agreement of purchase and sale, even if it's not signed, because I want to see what you put in there, and you give me the client information, and I will review it, and I will let you know what I find. I will treat it like a regular review if it was conditional on status. And I will get back to you and I will tell you what I think. And if I think it's a go, then you could go in firm. Okay? Now, a lot of agents will take advantage of that and, and call me. Now, sometimes they'll call me at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, we're making an offer today at 4. Can you do it? I can do it sometimes if I'm not that busy that day. Now, if you call me on June 29th, you're probably not going to get it done because I'm going to be too busy. Call me at the end of the month. But it, it's there's no harm in trying. The longer time you give me, the more time you give me, the better chance I'm going to be able to do it. If I get a status certificate that has problems on it, I'm going to tell the buyer there are potential problems. And they're going to ask me, well, should I go ahead? And I'm going to say, I don't know because I have to call the property manager and find out what those problems are because you're going to need to know what those are before you decide to go in firm. Some property managers will not call me back that quickly. They're not treating your situation as urgent as you would like it to be treated. But if it's a clean status, and I can usually tell by looking after five minutes, by looking, taking a quick look at it, even though I do a full review, if it's a clean status, I will tell you it looks good. Go ahead, wait the condition. Don't even just go in firm. Okay? So you can take advantage of that. I'll do it for you. But you have to give me a little bit of time. That doesn't mean call me at four and say we're making an offer in two hours. 
in E2. Some agents will say, uh, the lawyer I used last time just looked at the first page of the status and told me it was okay. That's no good. That's not doing a status review. That lawyer is not doing a good job and is not protecting their client and not advising them about everything. I will look at the whole thing, everything. So you can be sure that if I do a status review, I do everything. I'm also going to look at your agreement that you put together to see if it makes sense. Because a lot of times when I review a status and I compare it to the offer, there's always problems with parking and locker because they're always misidentified, identified incorrectly, not identified at all, not there, wrong spot, tandems, there's all kinds of problems. So that's why I say I'm not going to look at it unless you send me the offer, even if it's unsigned, because I'm going to compare what you think the client's getting to what I see on the status. So if you put in two parking spots, I'm going to look for two parking spots in that status. And if I only see one, that's a problem. And I'm going to, that's a showstopper right there. I'm going to say, why do you think you're getting two spots? The status only shows one. Okay. So that's my talk a little bit on status certificates um, that I can look at before you go in firm. And I'm, we're getting more and more of those because the condo market is still pretty hot. Yeah. What would the cost be? Let's say you do the review and it's not suitable. So they and they, they cancel the deal? Yeah. Zero. I don't charge for that because I know that the client is going to come back. And I've built up goodwill with the agent. And a lot of times I'll just say, they'll say, how much do I owe you? I say, are you going to buy in the future? Yes. Don't worry about it. We'll deal with it later. I don't send them a bill for that. I once had a client that had I think, three deals that she canceled every one of them. Now I billed her for that because I spent hours and hours on it. But she, she didn't mind paying. She ended up buying something else though. So, but uh, no, I don't, I don't, I won't bill them for it. Um, another problem I see on agreements are issues with estate sales. How many of you have bought or sold involving a state? Okay. The problem with estate sales is that uh, oftentimes agents will not turn their mind to the most important question you have to ask anytime you see a state of an agreement of purchase and sale, which is probate. Right, probate. Question is when you're buying and the seller's in a state, or when you're selling and the seller is in a state, the one question you must ask is whether or not probate has been applied for or granted. Everyone know what probate is? Probate is the process whereby if a, if a deceased person owns a property, they cannot sell that property. Okay, I'm talking about an individual deceased person. I'm not talking husband and wife. I'm talking little old lady passes away, her children, whether she has a will or not, that's just another issue. Her children want to sell the property. They cannot sell the property unless somebody, a lawyer, we do this, has applied to the court to get what's called probate. Probate certifies that the will is valid and it gives the authority to the people named in the will to sell the property. You cannot sell the property without that. Simple as that. So when you're doing any time you see the word estate, in an agreement, when a seller is selling the estate of Mary Jones, you as the listing agent need to know whether or not probate is granted. Because if it's not, it has to be applied for. And the next question you're going to ask me is how long does it take to get probate? And the answer is I don't know. It depends on how busy the courts are. We just, we're in the process of doing one now, and I can tell you it took four months to get probate. So it takes time, you've got to gather all the assets of the estate, you've got to get the right people in design, you've got to apply for it, you've got to send it to the court, they take their time in reviewing it. And then when they issue it, then we can sell the property. So if you're doing an estate sale, whether you're buying or selling, and it's a quick closing, beware, it will not happen without probate. So you need to address that, and in the event probate hasn't even been applied for, then you need to have, there has to be a clause in the agreement dealing with that saying that gives the seller the right to extend the closing to allow time for the probate to be issued. If you don't have that, it's going to be a dead deal. In one month, that deal will not close unless the parties agree mutually to extend, which they usually do, but they don't have to. 
So beware when you're buying and the word estate appears. You need to ask some questions and get some answers. Everybody understand that? Great. What are the complications when there is no bill? Okay, so when somebody is selling a property, a deceased person is selling, and we have to get probate, there are two ways. There's either going to be a will, which is sometimes the case. We can apply for probate with the will. Where there's no will, it's a little bit more complicated because somebody has to apply to be the estate trustee. It's usually the kids or a relative. It will take longer to get probate. That's what, that's the answer. So it's easier with a will, but it, we do them with or without wills. It doesn't matter. I've sold some lots, and I've come across a few of them that the um, geo warehouse shows the person's name, but yeah. then once I get to them, they go, oh, that person died. Right. They go. So how common is that to come across something that doesn't say the estate of? Well, very common, because a lot of times people don't ask the question. So if you're the listing agent on that and you're taking a listing, who are you dealing with? Uh, their kids. You think you're, that's right. Yeah. So you're going to say mean, to the kids. Once I made that phone call and I right. realized, you right. know, then you so, know, right? But you did the right thing because you talk to the kids and say, you got to find out who's the owner of the property. You can't assume the kids own it. Geo Warehouse may have her name, but you're going to say, well, where's your mom? She has to sign that she died. So then you know it's an estate sale. So a lot of times I will get agreements that say, Mary Jones, and I don't know that it's an estate sale. I have no idea. Until I see sometimes, I will see on the signature line, I will see her, her estate trustee. Then I go, she's dead. Then I call the agent saying, is the seller alive? No, she died. Oh, have you asked about probate? I had one last week where I called the agent. I had a young, nice young Chinese couple come to me. They wanted to buy a property. They wanted me to act for them. The agreement said a state of. I asked them. They, I knew they wouldn't know the answer. I said, do you know if the seller has obtained probate? They said, what's probate? I said, hold on a minute. Call their agent. I said, do you know if the seller has applied for probate? He said, what's probate? I said, okay, just let me deal with it. Then I called the seller's lawyer. I said, you're acting for the sale. Do you have probate? I said, please don't tell me you don't know what probate is. <laughs> he said, we have the probate. I said, good. Now I know this deal's going to close. If they would have said we don't have it, I would have said to the buyer, your deal's not going to close in three weeks because they won't get it in three weeks. But they had it. So you got to ask these questions. Okay. Um, another one. Okay, this one is coming up more and more often, and it's it's confusing. Now, when you take a listing, and you often will include in the agreement things like air conditioner, furnace, hot water tank, water softener. I don't know. Is there anything else you could think of? Sometimes. Normally, you'll see hot water tank if rental. And then it, in included chattels, we'll see air conditioner, furnace, water purifier, all this stuff. When you include it as a chattel, that tells the buyer that they are getting that item free and clear. In other words, it's included in the price. They are buying the air conditioner. They're buying the house with the air conditioner. The problem is that sometimes we come across the situation where unscrupulous companies, they can't do this anymore, it's illegal now, you'll knock on the, old, on the old lady's door and say, we can sell you a brand new furnace and a brand new air conditioner sign here, 80 bucks a month. And she says, oh, I need one because mine is 50 years old. She signs here, what she didn't know is that she signed an agreement with one of these companies which allows them to register a notice of security interest on title to her property. You know what that is? That's a mortgage, that's a lien. And that means that when she goes to sell her property, that item is not a rental, it's a rent to own. Meaning that that item will be have to will have to be paid out in full on closing. So imagine the shock, and I've had this happen, where I'm selling a property and the buyer's lawyer sends me the title search requisition letter and says, on title, is a notice of security interest in favor of so-and-so company for an air conditioner. 
we want it discharged. In other words, we want it paid off on closing. I look at the agreement and it says air conditioner to be included. Then I got to call the seller and say, guess what? You're going to have to pay that thing out in full. Why? Because you weren't asked the question by your agent, is this a rental item, pure rental, or is it a rental owner? And the only way you know that is by doing a title search or by asking the seller, let me see the papers that, let me see the bills that you pay and you'll have a better idea. If they have any inclination that they've signed one of these rent to own deals, then better they find out now because if you know before, you can put, instead of saying included as a chattel, you can say rental to be assumed. And then the buyer assumes it, the seller doesn't have to pay it out. I had one client that had to pay 10,000 bucks out this thing and she didn't know about it because she didn't her agent didn't ask her and she signed something without knowing what she was signing so that's important uh, closing dates um, I'm often asked by people can we do a quick quick closing and the answer is it depends if it's a sale if you called me today and said I have a deal closing a week from today, it's a sale. Can you do it? The answer is yes, no problem. All I need to do is get some information from the seller, uh, typically their tax bill, the mortgage statement. I can do it, no problem. When you're buying, it's a little bit different because the first question when you call me and say, Lauren, I want to, I have a quick purchase. It's closing in a week. Can you do it? The first question I'm going to ask you is what? What do you think I'm going to ask? Right. Good, good answer. Is there a mortgage? Because I can do everything I need to do to close that deal. The question is whether or not the buyer has their mortgage in place and whether their lender is going to give me their mortgage documents that I need to prepare for closing. So my answer is uh, generally, if you want to close in one week, if it's cash, no problem. If you want to, if you want to close with a mortgage, it's probably going to be a problem, which is totally out of my control because I don't know when you're, I don't know which lender you're dealing with. And I don't know if your lender will instruct me so that I can pre prepare the documents for closing. If they don't, I won't get the money, your deal won't close. So the lesson there is when you are, when you have clients who are buying and they want to quit closing, you better be ask them, do you have your financing in place? Do you have a pre-approval, a commitment? Is your lender ready to instruct the lawyer right away? Or are you still shopping around for the best deal? Because if you're shopping around and we're closing in 10 days, you're going to have a problem. I guarantee it. Your lender will not turn around. People think buyers who I understand don't know the process. They think when they go to the bank to sign the documents that everything's taken care of. They're wrong. The bank then has to instruct their head office to send me the mortgage documents. When they're going to do that, I have no idea. That's out of my control. So what I tell clients is, I don't have your um, any deal. If I don't have your mortgage instructions 10 days before closing, you're going to get an email from my office warning you that I can't give you an appointment to sign, can't tell you how much money you need to close, and I can't prepare your file because I don't have your mortgage documents. So you better get on them quickly. And usually I scare the you know what out of them with that email, and I warn them if I don't get this, your deal won't close, you're going to need an extension, the seller may not give you an extension. The seller may charge you for an extension. Do you want this to happen? No. Well, then you need to get on um, your lender's back and get me the documents because I'm paralyzed without them. I can't do anything. And if I get them the day before closing, it may not work. Because some of the B lenders require me to have the client come in three or four days before closing, sign all the documents, send them to the lender. They take their time to review them. They may say they're deficient. They may say we're missing things. I don't get the money. So it's important that when you have a client who's bought, you tell them right away, you need a lawyer and you need to get your mortgage in place. If you don't do those things, you're asking for trouble. I've seen it happen too many times. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the agents who tell their clients it's okay to buy and sell on the same day. It can be done. I hate it. I don't like it because it puts incredible pressure on us. And we have to set expectations with the clients who tell, who 
say, oh, my agent told me it happens all the time, it won't be a problem. That's right, it won't be a problem, except it becomes a problem when your sale doesn't close, for whatever reason. So on the day of closing, I get a letter from, or call from the buyer's lawyer on your sale saying, we need a one-day extension because we don't have mortgage instructions, or we don't have the money. Well, now I have to call the client, and I'm calling them at 3 o'clock sometimes, and they're expecting me to say, come and get your keys, and I'm saying no. I said, your sale's not closing today because the buyer doesn't have the money. What does that mean? It means your purchase isn't closing today because I can't get the money for your sale, which I need to buy. And then I could say, and I told you not to do this, but I don't say that. But what I do tell them at the beginning before they do anything is, if you want to do it, go ahead. But I don't recommend you do it. I recommend you get a bridge loan, close your purchase the day or two before, close your sale after. So any agent who says to a buyer, it's okay to buy and sell on the same day, proceed at your own risks. I'm going to tell you don't do it because I've seen the horror stories. You can imagine on a Friday, like we're going to have coming up at the end of this month, actually we're going to have two days off because Friday is Good Friday. Banks, registry office, closed. Monday is Easter Monday. Banks probably closed. I think registry office is closed. You can imagine if I have a buy, oh God, I hope I don't. I think I do. I think I have a buy and sell on the Thursday. If there's a problem on any one of those deals on Thursday, he's not going to get his keys till Tuesday. All because he didn't want to pay for a bridge loan. And there's nothing I can do about it. I'll do everything I can to close, but I don't have the money. You're not getting the keys, right? Or worst case scenario, I could close your sale. In other words, so you won't be in default of that. But guess what? I ran out of time to close your purchase because they only have till five o'clock. So now you don't have a place to live. You got your stuff in a truck. Welcome to Holiday Inn. And there's nothing I can do about it. You can avoid that by getting rich. It's real simple. Those are some of the biggest things. So I, I tell you all the bad stuff. I have to. Uh, it's not all bad, though. What questions do you have? Yeah. Uh, what is the minimum days you needed between the title search and the closing? Uh, there's no there's no there's no minimum days. All I will say to you is, if I'm buying, I want the title search date as close to the closing date as possible. How, how many days? The best ten days. It doesn't ten matter. days or uh, seven days? Sure, seven, whatever. It doesn't matter. I don't, miss, I don't miss title search dates. The only time I miss them is when the agent doesn't give me the offer until after the title search date has passed. Then I say to the agent, you're going to have to get an amendment because I can't, I've missed the title search date. <laughs> we don't miss them. So as long as you get me the offer before we have them diarized, we don't miss title search dates. Okay. Uh, it happened for me the lawyer for God to do title search. Altogether? All together, uh, even our office sent the document to the lawyer, but the lawyer forgot to do it. I just you can't said. close the deal without it. No, no, actually, the lawyer told me I did it after the day. Oh, he missed the day. He missed the day. Okay. But yeah. my question is that yeah, if that happens, it, it happens. If, no, some, not if, something, day, if something is in title, who is responsible for that? What's on title? The, the seller could take the position, you missed the title search date. If there's a problem with the title, you have to take it with it. That's why you don't miss the date. Who has to pay? The lawyer has to pay? Has to pay what? Any loss? Probably. That's why the lawyer... Probably. Should. Yeah, probably. So you don't have insurance? We have insurance, of course. Of course we do. But what's the loss? Like what, it could be nothing. You know, it, it, it depends what it is. Nothing, actually. The, 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 um, I mean, I'm not going to say I've never missed a title search date. Maybe missed one. And of course, the one that you miss is the one that has a problem on the title. <laughs> Just, of course, right? Uh, but it usually works out. The idea is don't miss it. There you go. As long as I have enough time, if you give me, if you sit, if you send me a deal today and the title search is March 20th, I'm going to probably say I'm, I'm not on enough time to do it because I can't take my staff off everything they're doing and say, do this, when they've got maybe closings or other title searches to do. So I'll say, I looked at the deal, the title search date is today, you better get an amendment, change it. I'm not going to be responsible for the fact that 
either you or the client waited too long to send me the offer. They signed the offer a month ago, but they didn't bother to pick a lawyer because maybe they were looking for the cheapest lawyer. I don't know. I'm not going to be put in that position. I'm going to say, I'm not, I'm not, you're going to have to get an amendment. Or I'm going to tell the client, listen, there could be something entitled that you're stuck with. You know, it doesn't happen that often. Any other questions? Just getting back to the scenario about the buying and selling on the same day. Yeah. What What's the ideal position? For a week for bridge buying? Doesn't even matter if it's a day. Okay. I mean, some people will bridge for a week, a month, three days, four days. It doesn't matter as long as it's not the same day. It makes it a lot easier. It gives us some time in case there's a problem. It's up to the client, really. I mean, some clients, I would, if I was buying and selling, I would not do it on the same day. I think get get you out of your mind doing it because who wants to? Be out of one house and try to get into another in the same day, especially if you have kids. It's it's too difficult. So some people will bridge for a week. They'll say, oh, I'll close my purchase, I'll get my keys, I'll move in slowly, no rush, close my sale, no problem. Some people want to some see people bridge for two months. They want to do renovations. They they want to paint, whatever. Um, it's just easier. Um, I recently sold a condo townhouse in Vaughan, yeah. and we had to close an escrow. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't sure what was happening at the time, but it You're did. You're buying or selling? I was on the buyer side. Okay, so what that basically means is that we have till 5 o'clock to register the documents. What sometimes happens is, um, for various reasons, typically the lender not sending us the money in time, we can't get the money in time. We then can't get it to the seller's lawyer in time. So it's 5.15. I've got the money now, but it's too late to register. So what we'll do is we'll call the seller's lawyer and say, we have the money. Can we close an escrow? So what that basically means is we're going to close the deal, but we're not going to register the documents because we can. You will agree to release the keys. We, we will uh, agree to allow you to release the funds. We will register tomorrow morning. No big deal. We have title insurance, which protects the gap, so that if anything, any registration appears in between that time, we're covered. So it happens from time to time. It's it's not unusual. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it happens. The deal closes is all you care about, right? Yeah, it did, it did end up closing, but I wasn't it's sure okay. what was happening. It just means that the documents don't get registered until the next day. Any other questions? What day of the week do you prefer closing? Anything but Friday. But Friday, right? Yeah. Thursday's a good day. Wednesday, Tuesday. It, it doesn't matter, really. I mean, I'm, I can close well, the Well, that's what you Friday. think. It's just a lot of clients want to close the Friday, right? Because they, they yeah, figure I understand. the weekend. Yeah, right? I understand. Uh, but Friday, again, it can be a problem if there's a, a delay because then you've got, I can't do anything in the weekend. I can't register. Nobody's around. Um, it's like, when I get the call, you know, uh, or when I get a, a panic email from the realtor at eight o'clock at night, uh, my client got the keys, moved in, and the seller's still there. What do you want me to do? Wait, wait, okay, I'll get right over there with my gun and tell them to, you know. It's like, there's nothing you can do. Just be reasonable. They got to be out. Give them some time, you know. Have you ever run into a situation where, uh, you know, the agreement is set that the uh, uh, seller was certifying that they were not a, a non-resident during the, the check the work. No. Um, all I'm required to do is the buyer's lawyer is get a statutory declaration from the seller saying that we're not non-residents on closing. Well, if they have provided that, we, I won't close without it. We have, they have to get it. Otherwise, I'm going to say to the other lawyer, I don't have your stat deck residency. Um, Without it, you're going to have to hold back 25% of the sale price. You give me an undertaking not to release it until you have a clearance certificate. So you, you would take care of that? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, don't, we won't close without that. It's, that's a showstopper. We'll, we'll usually know if the seller's lawyer um, doesn't surprise us, we will, you, they will, if, they're, if they're on the ball and not all of them are, they'll tell us our seller is a non-resident. We're going to give you an undertaking. I should usually know that before closing, but sometimes some sellers' lawyers or disorganized, chaotic offices don't know what they're doing and won't tell me to the day of closing. And then I'll say, Well, where's your section 116? Oh, our client's a non resident. Oh, but you're just telling me this on the day of closing? So where's your undertaking? Oh, well, we haven't drafted it yet. Well, when you get it to me, we'll close. So 
that, that would be another reason for perhaps not having that closure. It's never happened to me. I usually know in advance. Most deals don't close because of money issues. They don't have the money from their lender. They can't close. That's usually what happens. And it happens sometimes without any notice. Sometimes I know two days before. Sometimes I know three o'clock on the day of closing when we call them and say, where's your money? And they say, uh, we're going to need an extension. Oh, are you going to let me know or are we just going to you know, play games here? Oh, yeah, we're asking for an extension. Great. Send me a letter and I'll let you know what my client wants to do. There's a lot of, just like anything else, there's a lot of bad lawyers out there. Uh, typically the mills, the factories that have too much, too many files and not enough people to deal with them. And uh, those are the ones that are cause problems. Any other questions yet? What advice would you give an agent that's double ending? Um, well, first of all, I, I have never understood how you can double end. It's like me double ending. I don't do it. Um, I just, I have a problem with divided loyalties. I just can't, I know you can do it. I know there's a proper way of doing it. I would just say be careful because if anything goes wrong, they're going to blame you. They're going to, they're going to say you preferred one over the other. I guess I'm trying to say like, what, what have you seen go wrong? Oh, everything. Everything. I, I mean, this isn't a big one, but. I've acted for a client who bought a $3 million house. The agent double ended it and they're fighting over the deal closed and the seller removed all kinds of items that my client says they shouldn't have removed. The agent's caught in the middle because the agent's trying to resolve it, but can't play favorites. That's just a, that's just one, that's a minor thing, but the client is not happy because he's probably saying to his agent, the buyer, well, you're on their side. Right, and the uh, the seller's probably saying, "Well, you're like you're caught in the middle." I just listen. I know you can do it. I, I don't agree with it. Uh, if you do it, uh, do it right. But hey, I know you just do it. I just I don't get it. I don't I don't understand how you can do it. I don't understand the process enough. Um, except I will tell you that I won't I won't act for both sides on a deal unless it's there's got to be rare circumstance. I can. In some cases we will, but very, very rarely, because I know if there's a problem, they're gonna blame me, and they're gonna point the finger at me, and I will have to tell them if there is a problem, I can't act for either of you. So I've wasted all kinds of time and money, and I just don't need the headache. I just sold a house in Brampton, and like every other person that came in said, oh, you, can you represent me? We can go to get a better deal, and it's like. So you can. So take that as a customer and let us yeah, client. Exactly. They want the client to build. Tell them no. Yeah. You don't have to. Nobody's forcing you to. Doing it so you, they can squeeze you anyway. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? If you want to give me your business card on the way out, I'll add you to a newsletter. If you ever have any questions, email me, call me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.